Hello, welcome to Enlightening with my guest today, Adib Sai Kelly. So nice for you to join me today. Thank you so much for coming. Ah, it's my pleasure. <laughs> Good. Adib is a global field principal engineer here at VMware. What does that mean? What does your title mean? Um, well, my title means that I'm customer facing and okay. I get asked to um, do a variety of things from uh, looking at application code to help figure out how to make it more cloud native to meeting with executives and, you know, CIOs and EVPs at the banks um, and kind mm -hmm. of uh, uh, like writing the architecture elevator, um, as, as um, others would say, from, you know, all the way from the executive suite down to the boiler room. Um, so I actually like to call myself the code janitor. But that's not a legal. It's <laughs> not allowed at, at VMware. And no, I think you totally need some business cards. A team psych alley. <laughs> janitor, <laughs> code janitor, cloud. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one thing. So my coworker Kote introduced me to you virtually, but then we got to meet in real life recently because we were both speakers at Dev Nexus. And it's my understanding that you have like a good deal of speaking experience. Is that true? That is very true. Yes. Yeah, I've been. So it was my very very first time presenting at a conference. So I've been interested in um, in public speaking and how to get good at it. And I've been reading a book. Uh, Confessions of a public speaker, it's called. Uh -huh. And one thing I learned is that the fear response of right before you public speak is is like deeply ingrained into your biology. It's a human biology because as we were evolving to have only like a group of people and you're separated from the group and all the eyes are on you, that's a really bad situation to be in as like a cave person, you know, as an of so that's a that's a life threatening situation, and it should elicit huge fear responses. So the right. book says you don't have a chance of getting rid of them. You just need to learn to channel them. So and with that, I, like, how do you feel about that take for one thing? And if you do have ways that you channel that energy, what are those ways for you? Oh yeah, yeah. Like so, my biggest fear as a public speaker, and it has never gone away, is that uh -huh. people are going to ask me a question that I should know the answer to, but I don't know the answer to. I relate to that very much. <laughs> so it, it's more it's more that. Uh, uh -huh. My strategy for coping with that possibility is to imagine all the hardest questions that somebody will ask me, and then I keep um, I, I, I keep like figuring out what the answer is. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I'm, I'm sure people are going to ask me those questions, and I do these presentations, uh -huh. and no one ever does. And I'm like, I thought those <laughs> questions were going to come up, and nobody asked me. So. <laughs> Um, Just, so the bottom line is to be prepared for those questions or is the bottom line, don't bother to be prepared for those questions because no, you're I not going to get asked? The bottom line is you should be paranoid. It's okay <laughs> to be paranoid, but okay. also, also it's only like with time and experience, you do a few of these successful ones. Here's, here's I'll, at the end of the day, what I found out. I, I used okay. to like first few presentations I did, it's like, oh, why should I be the one that's on stage, right? Mm -hmm. Like what qualifies mm -hmm. me to be that? I feel that. And um, I kind of felt like, you know, you have to be like a super expert and all of that. And then I, I, I went back and I realized when I was in university, the worst professors were the ones that were the biggest experts in the field because oh. everything, everything was obvious to them, right? Like there was uh -huh. nothing hard, right? Like they are uh -huh. so immersed in what they're teaching and, and the topic. And I realized uh -huh. that what the people are that are attending the talk are there for, they're there to learn something. So uh -huh. I realized that I can really, uh, it's about the attendees, not about me. And mm -hmm. if I can teach them something uh, mm -hmm. in a way that is um, uh, efficient so they don't feel like they get lost. So my number one priority as a public presenter is I don't want people to get lost. I want to have a lot of on ramps to come back mm -hmm. into the into focus because nice. I lose focus in, in a yeah. presentation. <laughs> and in nice. a large one, you can't hit pause, right? Like not like YouTube, you can't just say pause it and let's let's keep going. So I try to build these on ramps where they can come back. Maybe I I'll pause. I'll ask them what they think about something. Hey, mm -hmm. there's a diagram. My favorite one is here's a diagram. 
how many like mm -hmm. let your brain absorb it for 30 seconds mm -hmm. here what it is we summarizing things so all of these are, are how i get over it that's so. fantastic we have um, a lot of love in the chat right now. I want to say hello to everyone. Nick, the first one. Good to see you, friends. We got Salaboy. Hello. He was, uh, you were the guest, Salaboy, in the most recent show. So it's nice to have you on the other side. We have Keith Lee. Hi, Keith. And, Hi, uh, <laughs> and Bob, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say your name. Bob USA Sidhark. Hi from India. You're in a favorite show. That's wonderful. Thank you so, so much. So I, I re relate to a lot of what you're saying. And I think some of those things, just because I'm such a beginner myself, like like I um, I like to have scaffolding, like I like to like maybe keep track of, of all of the benefits or, or have some sort of like big thing to come back to. And then just like you said, like recapping every once in a while is a really good yeah, thing. Yeah, and then the, personally. The, the, other, the other trick I always use is I, because I'm like so ADHD and I can't really focus on stuff, um, uh -huh. I have to watch videos on 2x most of the time and pause a few times yeah. on the way. Because <laughs> uh, I always go like, what's the talk I wish I could go to? Mm -hmm. I, always, oh. I always come up with the outline for the talk that I wish I could go mm -hmm. to. By definition, I'm not, uh, I don't yet know enough to deliver the talk. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So I very much relate to that when I'm like learning MQ or something and I'm, I'm having to choose like this piece from this resource and this piece and this piece, but where's yeah. this like, and I just like, why isn't this all in one place? It's like, oh, that's yeah. for me. That's, I'm supposed to make that. Yeah. And, yeah. and going back to the point you made earlier, it's taken a lot for me to feel enough ego to feel like I deserve to be the one to make that right. you, um, as such a new learner. So yeah, and I mean, like that one is I just at some point, I just accepted the fact that um, it's actually somewhat meaningless to be the speaker. All it mm -hmm. really means is that it doesn't mean you're smart. It doesn't mean you're uh -huh. off. It doesn't mean <laughs> that you're good. It doesn't mean that you're bad. It just means uh -huh. that you did some preparation. Mm -hmm. and, oh, I love that. And, and you just kind <laughs> of show people what you've learned, right? And uh -huh. uh, one of the things that I hit upon uh, early um, was that why do people get confused, right? So I was a trainer mm -hmm. for about 10 years. Okay. And, and in that time, I would go to uh, various clients and uh, sometimes I would have uh, I'd encounter the following situation. Uh, I'd be on a client site, uh, you know, students would introduce themselves. It'd be like, say, Java programming or something like that. Somebody uh -huh. would, would say, well, in 1973, I was a secretary. I took a programming course, aptitude uh -huh. course. They sent me to be a programmer. I became a COBOL programmer. And uh, now they want me to learn Java, and I retire in two years. Uh -huh. And and you're in a five-day class on, like, you know, I don't know, how to develop something with Java. And it's, like, and I, I got to fall in love with all these people because uh -huh. I'm, like, I don't care whether you have the background for something or not. My uh -huh. priority as the speaker is to try to move you forward as much as I can and try I to make that. you feel like it's not you. Like there's nothing wrong with you in the audience. Everybody in the audience mm -hmm. is afraid that they're not smart enough. Mm -hmm. and, and, and like when you're trying to learn something, unfortunately with tech, we have these things where in order to understand concept A, you need to understand mm -hmm. concept B. But to understand mm -hmm. concept B, you first need to understand concept A. So how uh -huh. are you learning that, right? Uh -huh. Because <laughs> concepts depend on each other, right? Uh huh. Yeah. And and I realized that that actually meant that the natural state is to be confused. Yeah. Uh. So to embrace the confusion and normalize the confusion. It's yeah, it's it's not it, it's not like normalize it. It's really the realization that until you learn enough about concept A and you uh -huh. learn enough about concept B, you're going to be confused about concept A and concept B. And then uh -huh. one day, for no reason whatsoever, <laughs> and you're like, why didn't I understand it before? <laughs> because I was gathering enough knowledge about each of those, like like. Mm -hmm. like so I don't know if that resonates or makes sense. 
that for me it does both i'd be interested from the chat if what y'all's experiences have been but with learning a new concept and what what has been effective for you or those of you who are speakers what is effective for you in that way but uh nick the first one says essentially accept that you need to go to the confusion before clarity that's wonderful it's just like accept that it's part of the process don't feel bad about it don't feel guilty it doesn't reflect on you as a person if anything it makes you an awesome person because you're learning new things and going outside of your comfort zone instead of just staying where you're comfortable yeah. good point yeah no absolutely i mean it's 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 the best it's one of the things that uh um i'm, I'm trying to teach my kids it's like it's okay to be confused there's nothing wrong with that mm -hmm. nothing wrong with you nothing wrong with the technology that you're using right it's just uh -huh. it's just a learning yeah. process and my takeaway from the conversation is not only is it okay, it's good. Yeah. It's, it's great. Yeah, um, so, Adib, I understand that you're writing a book. Will you tell us about your book while I move over behind the light board? I'm going to go ahead and post a link to it in the chat, too. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you for, for that. Um, yeah. So I'm writing a book called uh, Securing Cloud Applications. It's essentially a computer, it's, it's an application security book aimed at application developers. So the problem I ran into with application security started in the early 2000s. And uh, I was responsible for implementing security in, an, in this application that was um, running on HP IPAX. I don't know if anybody even remembers what that is. For some of you, yeah. it could be before you were born. Uh, <laughs> th these were some of the first handheld devices that ran Java on them. And okay. I got to ride around in a, in a, in a Sears repair truck trying to debug why my messages weren't making it to, the, to, this, uh, to this device. And, and so the first time, that's the first time I, I dealt with application security. And it was a lot of authorization rules. It was like, who is allowed to see this piece of data? When are they allowed to see it? And uh, how can you revoke access for their ability to see this data? And as I learned about security, uh, I found that a lot of it was aimed at uh, security professionals. So I'd pick up a book and it was, you know, math equations and security mm. proofs. And I'm like, I just want to write the code. Like, can you tell me how to configure, you know, this particular algorithm? And it was a trial and error because I would get these mysterious, nasty error messages. And I'd be like, I have no idea. Why am I getting this message? What does what this TLS handshake error mean? What is the cipher suite? How do I even turn on debugging for something? So I, I struggled my way through it for several months and years. And um, uh, I, I learned that the way to get unstuck is to understand uh, the basic patterns and protocols that all the stuff is based on. Started doing a bunch mm -hmm. of public presentations about that. People really, really like them. And I bet I, if, if the only resource they can find is like algorithms and proofs and not like practical knowledge, I can see how that would really resonate. Yeah, I mean the the, the practical knowledge is kind of available with the feeling of I found a blog post, I found a Stack Overflow. Let me copy and paste, but did I do it right? Mm hmm. Like, oh no, right? so, yeah, you don't know what you're doing. You can figure out what works, but you don't know why it's working. It sounds like, yeah, it's like it worked. We're done. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, after implementing security like four or five times in different distributed systems I worked on, uh, it was time to kind of go like, hey, I just want to write a book for developers. Here's what you need to know about security as a developer and uh, do it with applications. So as you go through the book, there's a consistent set of applications and scenarios. And they're very, very small apps. You run them. I encourage people to put breakpoints on them and kind of understand things from the point of view of a uh, developer using all of this wonderful security constructs that cryptographers have created and security engineers. Um, nice. My goal in life is that um, the developer learns uh, m more of the language of the security engineer and this and these and the cryptographer and can more effectively communicate with them. So That's I great. go a little I go to the layer below the frameworks, explain how that works in an understandable way and then um, uh, you know uh, ha have people take that and go wherever they want to go with it. like prepare prepare them for the real world of all the scenarios you'll encounter. That seems incredibly useful. 
I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to get a taste of that knowledge today. It sounds like your yeah. security, what an application developer needs to know about security. Yeah. So uh, where do, where's a good place to start? It seems like a, a vast topic. Yeah. So the, the good, the, the, the best place to start, and maybe this is not, not, not sure if, uh, how, okay, I'll explain it like this. So think of all the things you know about uh -huh. security today. If you know something about security, you can use it. Okay. If you, if you know that you don't know something about security, you can learn that thing. So if, let's say, for example, you're like, I want to store a password securely, and I'm going to store it in HashiCorp Vault. But I don't know Vault, mm -hmm. right? You know that you don't know Vault. You can go learn Vault. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it's the stuff you don't know, but you don't even know that you don't know it. Now that uh -huh. where you will get stuck forever. And you'll be like, why is nothing <laughs> making sense? Right? So, yeah, absolutely. Right. So a good example of that would be like somebody says, well, uh, I want to configure a um, uh, single sign-on login into my application. And mm -hmm. I want people to log in with Google or log in with Facebook, something like that. So they go to their settings and they start reading the manuals for whatever framework they happen to be using. Maybe it's Spring Security, maybe it's the equivalent of that in .NET or whatever it is. <coughs> and they get stuck. And mm -hmm. they get stuck because you don't know what you don't know about the OpenID Connect protocol, as uh -huh. an example. And if you knew yeah. what that is, then uh -huh. it, it would be very easy. The documentation would, would make sense. So uh -huh. today, I want to basically try to raise awareness and map out some of the things that developers don't know that they don't know uh -huh. and move those into the category of now I know that I don't know them. So I can learn <laughs> them. I, I think that's a great bite-sized piece to, to get at with the life board today. We actually have a question right off the bat, too. Yeah. What's the difference between security for a developer versus an operations person? Um, that's a really, really wonderful question. So, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it is. It's a, it's a really thank you for for asking that. So, I would say that um, the difference is that in operations, you are deploying and running a particular product. Your responsibility is to make sure that you've turned on all the security features. And when you've turned on those security features, there might be configuration settings like. Uh, I need to uh, put a certificate or I need to pick a password. You have to pick and configure those settings correctly, right? Now, for a developer, the responsibility is to is 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 multifold. One of which is that you have to engineer your application so that it is secure. You have to go through like, what am I actually trying to protect? Uh, mm -hmm. And a lot of the time, there's security that is, um, it's magic that happens for you. Like for example, uh, your system, your ops people will configure the load balancer to accept uh, TLS connections. So it's encrypted mm -hmm. the load balancer. And then the load mm -hmm. balancer might encrypt stuff to your app server. And mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about that piece. Mm -hmm. But who is allowed to make a change to a piece of data in your application? Hmm. Mm -hmm. That is a bit of business logic. Mm -hmm. uh, like, say, for example, it's a financial app that handles payroll, and mm -hmm. uh, it gets money from, uh, you know, maybe it's a five million dollar payroll, payroll, and so you're the bank, and the employees uh, of, you know, the, the the bank's customer need to transfer money into a certain account, so the payroll happens on a certain day. Blah 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 blah. There's a lot of rules about how you transfer $5 million that might require multiple approvals and this and that and multiple uh -huh. steps. So it's the developer's life when it comes to security is intertwined with the business logic. Mm -hmm. And it's starting backward from that business logic and saying, okay, if my I'm trying to achieve this security, this type of business process, how do I cleanly implement that in my application? Try mm -hmm. to push as much as you can into the underlying infrastructure so it does security for you mm -hmm. and the parts that are uh, truly the essence of the problem. So I don't know if I answered that question or not. If you can give me some comment, whether that my answer makes sense or for the person. <laughs> I thought it was great. So for the application developer, 
you're concerned with um, security as it relates to business logic and an ops person is more setting up security on an infrastructure level. Yeah, that is that is a very, very high, high level piece of it. But it's it's the the challenge with anything involving business logic is that it needs to happen in a lot of places. Yeah, because it's all over the application. Well, if that's going to happen all over the places, well, how do you do it in a way that's auditable? How do you do it mm -hmm. in a way that is um, uh, central? But you're, you're also too, as a developer, end up using a framework of some kind. Maybe you use like Spring Security. Maybe you use Identity mm -hmm. Server and .NET um, mm -hmm. or, or various other things. And the question is, are you using those things correctly? Mm -hmm. Right? And, yeah. and, and like, like the, the way I think about it is that if you think about like, like security has been in the news so much. I think about it as security can be a company ending event, as in your company mm -hmm. will be bankrupt if you if you mess up the security, or it's a CEO ending event, i.e. your CEO will mm -hmm. get fired. <laughs> <laughs> so a good example of that is, is Equifax, right? You know, I remember like a few years uh, ago, they, yeah. they got like hacked and all of these mm -hmm. millions of, of people's credit uh, credit histories were, 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 were accessed. And it mm -hmm. cost them billions of dollars. The CEO did resign. The CIO resigned. Mm -hmm. the CISO resigned. Mm -hmm. And so, and so the, the the point is like if you're a senior manager, like a CEO, you are now wanting secure applications everywhere. <laughs> yeah. so, yes. So what does that mean for you as a software developer? Mm -hmm. So as a software developer, that means that you know the CEO is going to basically say, well. I'm going to appoint a, a chief information security officer who's going to be a peer of the CIO. They're not the, they're not reporting to the CIO, so mm -hmm. and, and they're going to transform the organizational structure so we do stuff security. So as a developer, number one, you're expected to use all the security features in the products you're using. So if you're using okay. Kubernetes, you should use all of, all security features of Kubernetes. If you're using cloud, you got to use all security features in the cloud. So the question is, do you know how to use the security features of Kubernetes? I want to start capturing this. So, so what I'm what I'm starting to list here is just like basically a list of what application needs developers need to know about security at a high level. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Okay. Yep. Like this is the expectations of senior management specifically. Okay. So there's, there's, there's four things. Okay. Four things. So number one is use all product security features. Use all product security features. Got it. Yeah. Like too many times, you know, I see customers and uh, like customer code where it's going to be like, Sorry, uh, yeah, we turned off the security feature. We turned off like why? Because it was too hard. We don't know how to configure it. Like things like that, right? Really, that's the reason. It's hard. It's yeah, too it, hard. It is. Huh? It is a lot of the time. It's, it's it is just because like people just don't have a background to properly beat the problem into submission. Like a, a good uh -huh. example of that I see is uh, let's say like I've seen this in the banks. Uh, uh, or, or different things. It'd be like this. Hey, when the application deploys to production, um, you know, employees log into it, customers log into it, right? But when uh -huh. I run it on my laptop, I don't really have access to that thing that actually does uh -huh. the login. So they don't okay. have like a, a fake login module <laughs> okay. with a fake set of encodes customers and, uh -huh. and they can use that. So you always have this path of, this is what I do on my laptop. It's slightly different uh -huh. than what I do in, um, in like integration tests. It's slightly different yeah. than what really happens in production, and uh -huh. uh, people just don't have a good way of turning on all these features. So okay, it's 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 like because like bottom line, if there's a security breach and then it comes out you didn't turn on a security feature, people will be like, why didn't you turn uh -huh. it on? You don't want so to. So are you? So is it even more accurate to say use all product security features during development? Uh, during development, through to production, right? Like everything. Okay. 
So it's, it's, okay. it's really a question of, do you even understand what are the security features available in the, in the mm -hmm. products you're using? Okay. This is, this is the implicit question. Like if I'm using Kubernetes, do you know all the security features of Kubernetes that you should know as an application developer? Uh -huh. If you're storing something in the cloud, do you know all of the security features of the cloud service that you are using? Mm. Uh, not everything about the cloud, because nobody's going to know all of that, but the yeah. specific <laughs> thing that you're using. Got it. Like maybe you're using, I don't know, Amazon S3 to, to store a file. Do you understand mm -hmm. the security features of that? Mm -hmm. Did you turn them on correctly? Um, I ask uh, developers questions like, I see this like, oh yeah, we're going to cloud, great. What are you gonna do? Well, it's easy for me to spin up a database. Can you show me how to do it? Next, 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 next. Now they've launched a database on a public cloud provider. Uh -huh. Great, uh, but they skip past like three questions with the defaults for uh, security this, uh, security that, because they, they don't know. Like, what yeah. is the implication of this? Like. When is it my decision? When is it somebody else's decision? Is part of figuring yeah. out whether you're turning it on or not. Yeah. So your advice is don't wait for someone else's decision. If the feature exists, you should be turning it on. Yes. All security features are on all the time. Got it. Uh, the second thing is Here's, I have a I have a question about yeah, yeah. that actually. As I can I'm just guessing from a developer like perspective, that's not like the fun part of being a developer. That's like configuration and and like it's not the creating logic part. Right. Like, how do you incentivize a developer to want to turn it on and take their time with that thing that might be less interesting oh. to them? Yeah, so that's a really great question. So the the incentive is it actually makes your life easier. Okay. And it's it's kind of like it's kind of like you know, um, it's hard the first time you do it, uh huh, because you don't have the background to understand what it is. But it turns out that it's actually possible to learn all of this background stuff where configuring mm -hmm. things is so easy and fast that it's like it's easier for you to do it. So you don't have to go fight with InfoSec when you're trying to push your app to production as you go prove mm -hmm. that your application is secure. Yeah. Um, and once once people see that you, you're familiar with these things, they mm -hmm. kind of let their guard down a little bit. <laughs> what, what I see with the InfoSec teams is, is that they're making two judgment calls. They don't have the time to look at every line of code you've written. So they're judging yeah. you, the, the lead of the, the developer that's leading this thing. They're judging to uh -huh. see how much do you know about security? How conscious are you about it? If you look like the kind of person who knows what they're doing with security, then, um, you know, they'll be like, okay, we can go a little bit easier on you, right? Okay. Uh, yeah. A little bit and, less scrutiny. Uh, and more just a guess, but I can imagine too, it, it's probably a lot easier to turn it on at the beginning than try to uh, reconfigure yeah. your application to work with it later too. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That too. Yeah. That, that too. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, yeah. So the, the okay. second the, the second thing is that you know you need to follow corporate security standards. Okay. And that one is really hilariously funny. <laughs> and it's and it's like it should be obvious, kind of. Funny. No, no, it's not obvious. Why? Here's why, right? So okay, you'll go to one one customer and they'll uh -huh. be like, absolutely, we need this particular thing. Why? Because. Uh -huh. uh, our corporate security standards require. Then you go to another customer in exactly the same industry. Okay. And, and you're like, so what do we need to do to configure things securely? And they'll be like, mm -hmm. I'm like do you want this thing turned on? And they'll be like, no, uh, that doesn't isn't required by our information security standards, right? Okay. So you get, uh -huh. you get this kind of like inconsistency across organizations. So mm -hmm. essentially, at the end of the day, what's happening is it's about risk mitigation. Everybody is like, there was a standard and we followed it. So you mm -hmm. have to feel as a developer with the arbitrariness a little bit of some of these corporate mm -hmm. standards. So do you, A, do you understand what they are? Do you mm -hmm. know how to have a conversation with the risk security people? And... Um, uh, otherwise, if you don't, you get to waste a lot of time where I ask devs, like, why didn't you do X? Oh, security wouldn't let us. Why didn't you do Y? Well, security wouldn't let us. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
So <laughs> did you have a conversation with them about that? Well, we they always say no, so we just gave up and uh, did what they told us, right? And yeah. sometimes what they tell people to do is very unfortunate because it's not the best for security or the best for the developers or the apps. So yeah. It's uh that's the second one. The the third one Excellent. is is that you know you're kind of expected to design and implement secure applications. That's the thing, design and implement secure applications. Yeah, yeah. There's that expectation Excellent. that that you you can you can be you, you're able to do that. Like you're not going to make um, well known mistakes, right? Like for example. Uh -huh. Uh, one of the most common mistakes that people make is they forget to uh, uh, sanitize their inputs, right? So you have these things like the OWASP top 10. These are the top 10 mistakes developers make when they write code in, in a web application, right? Mm -hmm. So you're expected to kind of be familiar with those and not make those kind of, you know, one-on-one -on -one mistakes. Be familiar with one-on-one -on -one mistakes is a good way to, to write that. To capture that, be familiar with, like, uh, yeah, it's yeah. I would I would call it more like like you don't want to make the the common mistakes. You want to avoid the top ten mistakes that are published <laughs> okay. and well known, right? So there's there's and a, what if, yeah. Go ahead. What's a good strategy for knowing what the common mistakes are? <laughs> what, sorry, can you ask me again? What is the Oh, oh, what is a good strategy for being familiar with what the common mistakes are so that you could be oh, sure to sure. avoid them? So, so there is a lot of really good stuff on that. So you have things like OWASP, uh, O-W-A-S-P. So the OWASP top 10. Okay. So that's a list that actually changes with time. So this represents the top 10 most common ways that applications get attacked. And over the years, um, there's there's been things that have been added and things that have been dropped and things that have been consolidated. So two is you you have that in your security process. You have all these scanners, right? Like uh, that will tell you when you make some of these mistakes. So they'll they you know the code the security scanners the static analyzers will be like, hey, it looks like you forgot to sanitize your input. It looks like uh, be careful. This is like uh, a common area where people make mistakes. There's all sorts of techniques for dealing with it. And unfortunately, uh -huh. um, that's a very large area. Um, and the prerequisite for it is the underlying knowledge of all these security technologies and protocols. Like if you are, let's say you have a requirement like this. Uh, you're building an app, it's for mortgages, and uh, uh, customers need to upload their documents, like their financial documents for you know, their income, their this, their that. So the requirement uh -huh. says you need to store that in an encrypted manner, but then you don't, you're like, how do I do that? Like, how do I configure the uh -huh. encryption algorithm? It has 20 configuration choices. Which one do yeah. I pick? Uh -huh. Right? And then once I pick it, uh, how do I securely, like, you know, manage the keys? There's all these little things around it. So as a developer, you want to get really good at interacting with security professionals. So the security uh -huh. professionals... Uh, don't have to explain the basics to you. So every interaction yeah. with a security professional leaves you as a developer knowing more about security. So you you're advocating for developers to own to to be able to do the basics themselves, to own the responsibility of knowing the basics, and then yeah. it, security people can upskill you. But it's right. your responsibility to get at least get that is yeah, yeah. And I I kind of feel like that's maybe like a uh, a radical heretical statement because there's <laughs> okay. a lot of people that I run into that are security professionals whose basically this default position is that the developers don't know what they're doing and uh -huh. they're the number one security risk. And <laughs> okay. it's hopeless. They're never going to learn security, right? Uh -huh. I'm like, well, we haven't really invested in educating developers about security. Like, really, come on. Uh -huh. You can't just give yeah. up on all developers. So uh, we have we have a lot of activity in the chat, but let's take a little break and catch up on that. Sure. Um, Thindle's here. Hello, Thindle. I'm so glad you made it. It's been too long. Um, 
Oh, Salaboy says, be familiar with best practices and industry standards. So I don't even know when that came in exactly, but I guess that's what we were kind of talking about. Like, what's the best strategy to know about those things, about the common things you should know? Do you agree, Salaboy, with OWASP top 10? Um, we have a sanitize my input, but I thought we only lived once. It'll be fine. And then lots of lots of YOLOs from our developers. So I'm yeah. <laughs> Um, Nick, the first one agrees that OWASP top 10 is a really great place to start with security knowledge. Um, o data where you actually have access to some things, but after authentication, nothing is checked. I'm unfamiliar with O data, or if yeah, even I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, no, it's, it's just people like, like to use a tool to expose what's in their database table to a client. Mm -hmm. And they go like, why, okay. why, why, why? Like, and then they go like, oh, well, oops, we exposed too much. <laughs> YOLO. <laughs> yeah. um, so Nick, as a developer, is saying he's in a position where he thinks that the security people don't know what they're doing instead I of have, the other uh, way around. I, unfortunately, I've been in that position where I was sitting across the room from so-called information security professionals, and uh -huh. it boils down to, we have a spreadsheet. You must check all the boxes on the spreadsheet. And uh -huh. it's, it's, it's a combination of their because they're the ones that are signing off on this thing is ready to go to production, they're too scared uh -huh. to deviate from the, what's in the spreadsheet, even when uh -huh. the spreadsheet is old, wrong, and completely mm -hmm. moronically useless. And so mm -hmm. I had these, like, what do you, what's the name of that fictional character that fights with windmills? Uh, I, don't know. I, I don't know. Like, it's like, it's kind of like that sometimes because uh -huh. when you run into dated security standards or like, oh, uh -huh. like that made sense 10 years ago, <laughs> not anymore. Um, and and it and it even makes sense, like in this risk mit mitigation part, like why they're afraid to deviate from it. So then, why, like, what do you do to to break that cycle or to get them out of it? Who do you I have to go they, to? Who they're reporting to? I mean, going to who they're reporting to sometimes works, but you can't do that all the time. I think this is where it becomes like uh, you got to upskill the whole organization. So there's kind of the assumption uh -huh. that developers don't know what they're doing about security. But the uh -huh. infosec people know what they're doing about security, but not all the infosec people know what they're doing about security. So it's a bit of a, like, if you know more about it as a developer, you can, you can push back more effectively rather yeah. than just, yeah. you know, get it, getting stuck. Just giving in. Um, it, it sounds like uh, Don Quixote was what you're, you're yeah. after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That guy. That guy. Olive oil for the win. Yeah. And um, Spindle says, sounds like the old assume everyone is an idiot and you won't be disappointed. <laughs> Saying That's sad. It's a, it's a little true, but also maybe well, sad. Well, yeah. It's, and the, it, it's, it's <laughs> not like I've learned over the years that uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, like all of the complaints that people have are all wrong. Like it's never the people, the thing that people complain about is never the reason why it became very, very obvious to me. I was on a project with a massive international bank in 2004, uh -huh. uh, no, 2007 for a couple of years. We did something that mm -hmm. was impossible in a very short period of time. And um, what I found was the devs complained about the project managers and the management. Mm -hmm. Management complained about the project managers and the devs. And <laughs> oh. And the project managers <laughs> complained about <laughs> management and the devs. <laughs> and it was it was one of those things that um, became kind of a, uh, an issue because it's like everybody sees things from their point of view as opposed yeah. to from um, from the holistic picture. Yeah, Nick has actually a great comment. He's saying the same thing. I think the best approach would be to set aside everyone's ego and start looking at the global statements. Yeah, that's, that's uh, true in life in general, not just security. And right, that is correct. Yeah, yeah. Like if I and then Nick is going on to say if they have a security question, they'll probably learn more from OWASP, more from OWASP than who the security people in your organization. Mm -hmm. So let's 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 get into a little bit into the 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 kind of the fourth uh, bullet point, which is let's do. Um, you're also expected to enable a DevOps transformation. Enable a DevOps transformation. No DevSecOps. DevSecOps that makes more sense. Yeah. 
because like at the end of the day, all these organizations are upgrading their processes. Mm -hmm. And you're a participant in that. You're the dev in the DevSecOps. So you got to do your part of that. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to be holding back that transformation. Mm -hmm. to be accelerating that transformation mm -hmm. and um and and that that like uh dev secops is is a huge topic mm -hmm. and um um you know just be a good citizen this is fundamentally my message to developers you got to be a really great <laughs> citizen in the security when it comes to security yes Or is it transforming their processes? Devs, do your part. Yeah. Be cool, yeah. dude. Yeah, yeah. So, so now, now that we kind of covered that, let's let's get into like five problems that are things you should be very comfortable with as a developer, and maybe we can dig a little bit into what you need to know underneath some of them. Yeah. Before we go into this, we have a question from Thindle. What is DevSecOps? Uh, They're so, unfamiliar with that term. Yeah, yeah. So DevSecOps is um, the idea that where you have, you know, you, you kind of have like silos in an organization. So you'll have the information security people, you'll have the operations people, you'll have the developers people, uh, the devs, and you know, the devs will throw their code over the wall to ops. Ops will deploy it and run it in production, and then security is like, we're going to write a security standard. We're going to throw it over the wall. We're going to expect you to follow it as a developer, and you're supposed to. We're going to audit you to see if you're doing that, right? Uh, so that's kind of uh, what DevSecOps is trying to smash that all together and take more uh -huh. of a collective responsibility where we closely collaborate with each other, uh, and we're not we're not like kind of separate silos. Let's re-engineer the processes that we're using so we're not throwing stuff over the wall fundamentally. So that makes I, hope, a ton I, hope of that, sense. I hope that helps. And a little more um, from Nick, the first one, security people in their org seem to be only seem to be only saying you have this problem, but they don't understand that they're looking at the dev environment where they want more freedom. So yeah, that's, that's very, very common where uh -huh. uh, in the name of the security, things will get locked down so much that no one can be productive. Yeah, and and that's that's the part where it's not looked at as a risk mitigation, where mm -hmm. it's like, hey, how can we make things so that you can go fast and you can be secure? They're not exclusive. It's the it 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 shows a lack of imagination on the part of the security leadership, the dev leadership, and the ops leadership. Uh, like in a really mature organization, the goal is very clear. We want speed, we want safety. And ironically, mm -hmm. the faster you go, the more safe things can be in software. Interesting. Because right? you have to automate everything? Exactly. And oh, okay. uh, like if you look at organizations that do continuous deployment, they'll be like, we never roll back. We always roll forward. If there's an issue that's discovered with something that we've deployed, we quickly patch it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, a good example of that would be like there was the log4j shell thing in December. Uh -huh. yeah. Everybody was scrambling for patching things. Uh -huh. Well, the truth is it's not really log4j. Like it could be any library that you're using. So the question mm -hmm. is, are your processes mature? And did you play your role as a developer? to make it so that when something like that happens, you can be done your part of fixing that in mm -hmm. minutes, not hours, mm -hmm. not days, not like weeks, like in minutes. So mm -hmm. this is um, this is why I enjoy working for Tanzu because that's, that's fundamentally what we're trying to do. Amazing. So we have lots of color <laughs> commentary from Findle. Soon we'll have HR sec dev. DBA <laughs> ops receptionist. Yes. yes. <laughs> and Bindle's <laughs> and Bindle's uh, self-employed, so it already describes them already. Yeah. And one of the old jobs, Bindle had to pre-approve everything. Couldn't update Visual Studio. That sounds rough. Yeah. Salaboy agrees. Automate everything. 
And then Nick, the first one, the dev environments in the meantime are behind a private network. So you don't have access to the company VPN if it's not available to you. Yeah, this is this is one of the interesting things. Like if you look at the most newest kind of security things, people talk about beyond corp, like that's what Google talks about. Like we don't want a VPN uh-huh. anymore. People talk about zero trust and it's this idea of uh, there's no trusted boundary. Everything is equally untrusted. <laughs> Uh-huh. And being on a VPN and not being on a VPN, you you shouldn't need a VPN if you engineer your system oh. in the latest ways because it's gonna look at like what you're trying to do, where you're where where are you trying to do it, how you were authenticated, and so some of the more uh, modern thinking around that would lead you mm-hmm. to have a VPN. Interesting. All right, that was fun. Oh, we have another question. We almost got back on track. That's okay. I love this interaction. Um, what are the best tools should we use to turn on the security features plugins within an IDE? Right. So if you're new to security and you're a developer, I'm going to tell you you should turn on Sonar Cubes plugin. I, I, how, I, do you, I, how do you spell that? S O N A R Q U B E. Uh huh. Sonar okay, Cube. Sonar Cube. Yeah. And the reason why is that, like, it's not really intended. Like, it, it originated as more of a code quality tool, but it added mm-hmm. some security features. Um, about a year and a half ago, I was writing a lot of code on a project, and I decided to turn on every possible scanner that could bug me and tell me I was doing something wrong. Uh-huh. And, um, uh, and it was great because I realized that um, if you – when I took the time to address the things that these scanners were complaining about, my code uh-huh. actually got a lot better. I'm like, oh. did I design it this way. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. That kind of. So so that one is like, you know, without having more context on the situation the person is asking from, I'd say uh-huh. turn that off because that's something you can act on right away. It doesn't that's do, super cool. It, it, it'll do security and other stuff. And I, uh-huh. I don't know if it's the best security tool, but it's good enough. To get going with i i like that it's it seems to be giving you feedback in the moment so it teaches you to change your behavior that's cool yeah yeah and it gives a it gives a it gives a, an example of what you did wrong so it'll be like okay you're doing this here here's why i'm complaining here's the wrong way to do it here's the right way to do it excellent in, in a little ide panel yeah. and we have another question for you from sala boy if you're working with Kubernetes, what are the projects you should be looking at for security? Yeah, that's a that's a really good. So as a developer, uh-huh. the number one project to look at is the cloud native build packs. I think that was covered okay. in the previous show uh, because yeah. you don't really want to bother with like all the intricacies of correctly um, containerizing something, and you uh-huh. want to be in a position where it's easy to patch things. Uh, and so that's what what you get with that. So that's that's one thing. Uh, the other thing that I would look at with with Kubernetes is um, learning how to uh, like auto generating uh, your Kubernetes manifests. Uh, Kubernetes, okay. like really good Kubernetes manifests, will tend to be very very lengthy, and it's uh-huh. hard to do it on your own. <laughs> uh, yeah. So so things like Cartographer from Tanzu is is a good one because it will generate all these hundreds of lines of YAML for you. Um, Our, and, the enlightening episode next week is about the cartographer. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, so that's, that's one, one thing. Uh, uh, another thing I would look at, um, yeah, those would be the starting points. Those would be the starting Excellent. points. Excellent. Yeah. And it's, it's, and it's really, the, the last thing I'll say is kind of knowledge of just generic knowledge of security that we're going to talk about in a few, in a, in a few minutes. Cool. So we have a lot of people backing you up. Uh, Nick, the first one, wrote out Sonar Cube. So I'm a visual person. It helps me to see the word and not just hear the syllables. But Nick agrees that it's a good starting point. And Sala Boy says, yay, build packs, and shows you where you can find them. Yeah. All right. Now I think we're ready to yeah. maybe you we were gonna dig on in on these points a little more, you said. Yeah, let's 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 dig into like actual now, like technical things you should be very comfortable in. Okay. So maybe just capture the high level ones. So number one is secure TLS everywhere, secure communication channels. So this is kind of like another list where we're gonna talk yes, more. This is another list okay. of, of of kind of like 
technologies that you should be familiar with as okay. opposed to um, more higher level softer stuff. Okay. These are the ones you want to basically never be stuck on. You're like, you want to be the go-to person in your team when there's an error related to something. They'll be like, hey, Deeb, how do you solve this? What does this mean? And you'll be like, what does it say? You can be on the phone and you can walk them through how to fix that type of thing. <laughs> really <laughs> worth your time. Really <laughs> worth your time to, to master these things. Okay. What was the first one? TLS certificates? No, not TLS, TLS certificates. Well, so I'll, I'll kind of maybe explain it with TLS is the goal, but then we can go underneath and say, what do I need to know to understand that? So okay. does it make better if we start with the five things first and then uh, we go with what goes underneath? Uh, 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 like, how would you prefer to, 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 to draw it? We're going to talk about five technologies to be familiar with and then go in deeper about each type of technology. No, is that what I'm hearing? It's, it's five. Uh, well, no, it's five problems. Uh, five uh -huh. things at a high level, but there's prerequisite for them. So, for example, okay. if you want to understand TLS, which is the goal mm -hmm. that you want to be familiar with, you need to know digital certificates. To know okay. digital certificates, you need to understand public key cryptography. To understand public key okay. cryptography. So, like, drawing out that whole tree would honestly take more than this board. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know if we need to so, draw it. So, TLS is one of the five things that we're going to talk yes. about. Okay. Yeah. So let's so, let's just talk about everything we need to know about TLS. It's very helpful for me to know there are five, so I can use so I can. Yeah. So so be ready. So what you need to know about it is is not you you need to know the prerequisites about how it works so you can debug and configure it. Uh huh. So when you get something like a TLS handshake error, it uh -huh. should be easy for you to troubleshoot that. Without mm -hmm. having to go looking on like Stack Overflow and all of that, you know what the problem is, you know what why it occurs. You you you're, when you're googling for an answer, you're googling for a very specific setting in a specific library in a specific thing. So when you're when you're driving it, you're you're a good TLS driver, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so um, and and knowing TLS like gives you superpowers because it's so ubiquitous. Uh huh. Um, and, and, you know, uh, people are trying to make TLS transparent to the developer. This is like what service mesh is all about, for example. Uh -huh. Um, so if you have service mesh, you're like, why should I use it? Well, it does TLS everywhere. Well, great. But that still doesn't solve the problem for you as a developer, because you might call yeah. some API that is uh, a third party API. I don't know, maybe you're calling a payment API or something else. And they, they want a specific cipher suite. So it's like, if you're like, whoa, what's a cipher suite? Okay, that's where you need to know all the encryption basics underneath it. So cryptography, basic knowledge of cryptography is a prerequisite to understand TLS. Okay. So these are all prerequisites. Yeah, there's a, there's a massive amount of, 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 uh, of, of crypto basics and you can learn that crypto basics from the point of view of a developer, as opposed to from the point of view of a cryptographer or the point of view of a security engineer that's implementing the cryptography. Too many of mm -hmm. the books are covering it in too much depth for a developer mm. rather than, uh, than that. So, so um, um, like, I'll throw out a library if you're a Java developer. Actually, no, if you're a Java, it's not for C Sharp. It's for, it's for Java, JavaScript, uh, Python, C++, Objective C. There's a library called Google Tink, T I N K. Uh huh. That people might want to look into if they just need to do some crypto on their own. Cool. Um, anyway, so the the second kind of big big problem that you uh, uh, that you want to basically learn about is how to actually do uh, single sign-on. Like, so what, when when you were talking about this TLS earlier, you mentioned other things like uh, PKI infrastructure. And was there more to the like, prerequisites or you just think? 
like I, I'm going to put it, yeah, like cryptography, digital certificates. I'm putting digital certificates under the realm of that. Okay. Uh, I, I have like a giant tree of that. So, yeah, so you need to know digital certificates. Uh -huh. And then you need to know, um, uh, you need to also know AES. Which What's is AES? The, the Advanced Encryption Standard. Um, okay. Uh, you need to understand. So this is a symmetric algorithm. You need to know something okay. called uh, uh, um, H, uh, hashed methods, me message authentication codes, HMAC. HMAC. Yeah. And again, like these things do very specific, they give you specific security guarantees. You want to understand what security guarantee I get from an HMAC. What you don't want to learn, you do not want to learn or care how does an HMAC algorithm actually works. Like you want to know if I use an HMAC algorithm, what do I get, right? Uh, so high level only. Like what does it do for me? When do I use it? How do I use it correctly? Nice. Like not how it's implemented. Because once you go down the rabbit hole of the math and all the stuff underneath it, you might as uh -huh. well just become, stop being an application developer and become an, a, a cryptographer. <laughs> uh, right on. Yeah. So, so. I have yeah. another question. Yeah. Are TLS and SSL the same thing? Correct. They are. Uh, TLS okay. is just a renaming of SSL. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's Thank just. You. Uh, Secure sockets layer we got renamed to transport layer security uh, because it's, it's a bit more accurate uh, TLS for, for what it does. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of other things you want to add on there. You want to add ECC on that list of prerequisite. Uh, it stands for uh, elliptic curve cryptography. Again, you don't need to know how the algorithm works. You need to understand the trade-offs. So you'll need to understand like, hey, ECC is good for uh, why did it win over RSA? So there's ECC, there's Karma RSA. Uh, 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 like it's it's like there's there's always trade-offs in these things. Like ECC is mm -hmm. work better on mobile phones because it's less computationally intensive. It won't drain your battery as much. Mm -hmm. Which is I, a good thing. I love right? knowing the why. I'll remember it forever if I know why. But if you just tell me a fact without the underscoring, like why, it it'll go right out. Right, and then yeah. and so, um, like, like, like the like the there's too many. There's a lot of items in that prerequisite cryptography list. Partly because uh -huh. when you're dealing with these standards, you can't help avoid those words popping up. And when they pop yeah. up, you're like, what do they mean, right? Right. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> uh, we uh, have some some comments in the chat. Uh, Salaboy said Harbor Two would be good for Kubernetes. Security. Yeah, yeah, Harbor is good. Yeah, that's true. Yes. advanced scanning images yeah, good point uh nick the first one single sign-on can become quite difficult if you have a lot of customizations i'm going to talk about how to make all those problems go away oh i love that that's like yeah, the best yeah, answer it's going to be just two a couple of things you want to know about about that as a developer at least in 2022. Um, cool. so let me let me just check that my list of tls prereqs is it's not it's far from it's, it's very incomplete so you got digital search aes hmax ECC should put RSA on that list. Um, what does RSA stand for? It's just a name of algorithm. It's a class of algorithm. Okay. Um, for public key stuff, there's something called key exchange and key derivation. Anyway, uh, that list is going to get too long. Maybe we should just give up on okay. it. Okay. Put that, 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 ECC. <laughs> and that, more. That, that, ECC. Yeah. There's, you, you have to, you know, I, I hate to say this, just check out my book because, like, I really did boil it down. <laughs> in the first seven chapters for everything you need to know about crypto. Um, awesome. Cool. As, as, as a and, dad. And when you say crypto, I think, I don't know, but I, I think of cryptocurrency and not cryptography generally. Right. Yeah. But they, they stole your word. That no, 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 no. It's actually all based mm -hmm. on the same stuff. If you know this, okay. if you know those things, like the underlying prerequisites, it's going to be a lot easier to understand how the cryptocurrencies work. I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about uh, me and Bitcoin. So the day that Bitcoin came out, I installed the client uh -huh. on my laptop. Uh -huh. uh -huh. The next day, I deleted the client. I'm uh -huh. like, this is like probably got a virus in it or something. Partly because uh -huh. I was reading about cryptocurrencies in the 90s. Uh, okay. I was at university, and I'm like, this is such a 
crazy yeah. idea, never gonna happen. What did I uh -huh. know? Like, <laughs> for, for all I know, in the day that I ran it, I found a Bitcoin. <laughs> it's all gone now. <laughs> so um, we have Findo. There's some things that people spend their lives researching, but for us normal mortals, we don't do it better. We, so we just black box and trust it. Correct. That is correct. You want to use the black and, box correctly. And Findle says, I looked at some crypto implementation in math once and then backed out slowly. Just, just yep. don't make direct eye contact. Um, Celeboy has a question. What about application SSO and Kubernetes? I still feel like that is a big gap there. Um, we'll dig a little bit more into that in the SSO piece. That's okay. Cryptography was way before cryptocurrency, of course, of course. And then uh, Findle says, I sold four Bitcoins back in 2012. I got $1,000. What? Is that real? Okay. Yeah, it's like, it's like sometimes when you know too much about something, you're like, you dismiss the idea. And uh -huh. <laughs> one of those ones where I'm like, in retrospect, I'm like, darn it. Like, it literally was <laughs> the day after the client was published that I installed it. And I'm like, ah. Oh. <laughs> I should have kept it running. <laughs> All right. What's what's uh, step two of technologies we need to be familiar with as an app dev? So it's 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 really related to logging users in. And and to log users in, there's two protocols I want you to know. I want you to know OpenID Connect. Okay. And um, and and that's yeah, OIDC is what how it's shortened. For this one, since it's important, I'm going to spell it out. I couldn't do it. They don't have the space for the other ones. Okay. But I hear you. OIDC. Yeah, OpenID Connect. And the other one related to it is something called web authentication, web auth n. Auth n are, like that? Yeah. yeah. These are the okay. only two protocols you should learn about as a developer in 2022. Wow. Bold um, statement. Yeah. Well, the reason why is that um, uh, when it comes to like like logging in your users, the humans that are using your your systems, uh, OpenID Connect is so widely available and implemented in all programming languages, in all you know uh, various things that um, when you when you have all these customizations you have to do, uh, uh -huh. you can typically find that there exists a product that allows you to convert from the thing that you have to OpenID Connect. Okay. Uh, so for example, I had a, uh, a banking client that uh, at one point was like, when somebody logs into uh, uh, the online banking, they type in their bank card number and then they type in their uh -huh. password. And then that comes uh -huh. to the application and the application uh -huh. makes a SOAP call to the mainframe. And mm -hmm. if it, it the SOAP call comes back with it worked or it didn't work. So, how, how do I how do I integrate that? So the answer was well we created uh, an Open ID Connect server that mm -hmm. did that SOAP call. So uh, so it, there are frameworks out there like for example the Spring authorization server, uh -huh. which makes it easy for you in those nasty situations where you might need to roll out your own OIDC server to do to do it uh -huh. without okay. becoming a, you need more skills but it's not you don't have to implement the whole standard. Otherwise, like most of the cloud providers, uh, including us, like with, with Tanzu, it's, it's upcoming, it's Tanzu app SSO. We have these things that you deploy into your Kubernetes cluster. You give it a bunch of CRD and you're like, hey, can I just go and, uh, uh, you know, here's, here's my thing. Give me an OIDC server so I can use it as, as the app. So it's all you need to know as the developer, how to configure uh -huh. an OIDC server, how to configure an OIDC client. Um, so I, I don't know if that, that makes sense to folks. I, um, I guess what the thing I, I don't understand is where the web off end comes in. Yeah. So, so the web off end is, is, is really wonderful technology for, uh, kind of like two factor authentication. So here's the problem, mm -hmm. that, you know, we all know the problem with usernames and passwords is that there's too many of them. Right. And we would like to get rid of passwords and, um, uh, you know, we, we we also find that with passwords, it's easy to trick people, right? You attack the human, you don't attack the, the cryptography. 
It's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. I have the world's most awesome cryptography protecting my system. But if people mm -hmm. write their passwords on sticky notes mm -hmm. and you know, they pick their birth date or their cat's name or whatever, something that's easy to guess mm -hmm. around, that, that will compromise security. So uh, web often has to do with two-factor authentication? That is correct, yes. Okay. That is correct. And specifically a form of two-factor authentication that is phishing resistant. Uh, so you see like an example of that. This is like a little key. Uh, you plug it in to your, I don't know if you can see it on the, on the camera, but you, uh -huh. you this is the Yubi key. You plug it in, you press the button, and uh, it will um, uh, log you into things. So this works with GitHub, works with, uh, it works with uh, uh, Facebook, um, it works with Google Cloud, it works with AWS. Like these hardware security keys that check who they're talking to, make it so that you as a human are protected when you're tired. Like when I'm really tired and somebody is trying to socially engineer me into entering my credentials on a uh -huh. fake website, it, uh -huh. it doesn't matter how smart I am, how security knowledge I am, humans can be fooled. Like, like it's easy to fool humans, including myself. Uh -huh. uh, and so I like it when the hardware the so takes care of it. This is also, so WebAuthn is a protocol in JavaScript. So it's not a protocol. It's a JavaScript API that you use okay. to interact with what, with these authenticators. And it there's two types of authenticators. Uh, there are platform authenticators that are built into your machine. So for example, if you have a MacBook with a little thumbprint scanner, that thumbprint scanner is actually a, you can interact with it from your web app using web authent, which is pretty awesome. Um, yeah. If you if you have like if you use your iPhone, you go to you go to something that has web authentication. You can log in with your Face ID. You can log in with the equivalent of that from Android devices. So something like I think close to eighty seven percent of uh, people's devices have support for web authent today. It's a technology that hasn't been widely, widely. Uh, it's, I think, poised to become more and more um, common, um, and and people are starting to buy these keys. Like a uh, you know, classic story: my electrician logged into um, uh, logged on a, on a job site, logged into somebody else's computer to his Gmail, and he had all his passwords there. And then within two hours, people were buying, were draining his bank accounts. So you're wow. like scrambling to get that because I guess there was a key logger on there. Now they knew his Gmail credentials. So after that, uh -huh. he, got it. he didn't lose a lot of money. He managed to kind of stop it in time. Uh, but now he walks around with a Titan key from Google because he now knows like, you know, how important it is for two factor. In my case, like my wife is not a techie and uh -huh. uh, her Facebook was hacked. Right. And somebody turned mm. on two factor authentication. So she had to upload her driver's oh. license to Facebook to recover the account. After that, I got her using uh, one password and two factor everywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, with notes. So we have some some comments. I'm going to skip over all your your Bitcoin stories, friends. But yeah. uh, <laughs> um, we have uh, Azure has it done really easy. I guess I don't know the context for that. And we do like you for derailing the chat, Thindle. It's true. Um, Thindle says, there's always a risk of single point failure with SSO, but it's still better than the alternatives. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of single points of failures in what we design. And I think uh -huh. that where what distinguishes cloud native in particular is that we are designing our systems to recover rapidly and automatically from failure. So yeah. I'd rather I'd rather take uh, five minutes of downtime than make my life way more complicated. So kind of like recapping. So what are the protocols that you should know? TLS, OpenID Connect, Web Web Authn. So those are three in total so far. Uh huh. The the underlying thing below Web App the Web Authn is the API. The underlying protocol is called FIDO, or um, a C like Client to Authenticator Protocol CTAP, I think. But anyway, just call it web author and it's easier if you're a developer. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, and then yeah. um, we have we have SMS is a bad second factor, way too easy to middle submit in the middle attack with some social engineering. Attack a human. 
Yeah, that's right. Oh, so the, right. in particular, the SMS is easy to attack the phone company. So you just call up mm -hmm. the phone company and you're like, oh, um, you know, I lost my phone. I bought a new one. Um, mm -hmm. uh, can you activate this new SIM card? Right. And then they'll yeah. be like uh, asking you some security validation questions. And they'll be like, where do you live? And, you know, like a bunch of stuff that could have been obtained by yeah. somebody else. And then they have your your phone. They have a SIM card that to, they've taken over your phone number, basically. Um, uh -huh. But, but the, 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 the even if you use like the other stuff, like the one-time tokens and you didn't use SMS, the challenge is this. If you fooled the human to enter their password, uh -huh. you, you can fool the same human to enter the token. <laughs> I yeah. fooled you once already. What's so hard about fooling you again? <laughs> Give me one field. <laughs> can, I'll get you to give me the other one. <laughs> um, so Findle saying if if a, a user can be exposed everywhere if their SSO login isn't secure, and that's the single point of failure that they meant to. Yeah, I mean with. that 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 is that is a fair statement, and I think that um, uh, that's that's an area where the SSO provider is on them to really educate the user and insist on certain things. Like you will have two-factor authentication turned on. Um, in the SSO provider, you can give people the passwordless login option. Like, hey, do you want to, um, you know, turn on the security keys? You just look at your phone and you like, like this, the user experience is so much better with WebAuthn that it's, uh -huh. and it's easier to implement WebAuthn in the SSO <laughs> server. So mm -hmm. you should be able to, to, to kind of increase adoption that way. All right. Let's move on to the third one. So we have these three TLS, OIDC, WebAuthn are the three things people should know so far. Yeah. Well, so the next thing is, is, is not a technology. It's, it's really securing application credentials. So let's, let's put that in, on there. Uh, okay. as I can see. So securing application credentials. There isn't a protocol for this. So there's no industry standard. You have okay. to actually get into the mock of a specific product. Whereas okay. the first two items were like, because they're industry protocols, everybody implements them and it doesn't matter what programming language you're using. You don't have to know. If you know the protocols first, you can interact with any product. So under like securing application credentials, this is like, I need to be able to use a vault of some kind to, to store my API keys to store my passwords to the database, to store certificates, to, to do all these things. So this is like, you know, things like HashiCorp Vault, uh, KMS on Google Cloud, on uh, AWS, Azure Vault. Um, you got to really get comfortable as a developer using that uh, type of uh, uh, storage system for um, security for securing your the, the 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 creds that the application itself requires. So, as a developer, it's your responsibility to store the application credentials using a vault of some kind. Yes. And what? And you said, will you name some of the examples again? So there's like you know HashiCorp Vault, right? Uh huh. Um, and you know KMS on uh, Google Cloud and on AWS. Okay. And uh, you know Azure Vault on Azure. Gotcha. Cool. And and this is this is kind of a really really tricky area because mm -hmm. um, it's practically impossible to solve this problem without a platform. Here's why. So okay. people will be like, well, I don't want to store passwords, uh, keys and passwords and stuff in a text file mm -hmm. on my server. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take those and I put them in the vault. Great. You put them mm -hmm. in the vault. But how do you identify yourself to the vault? Mm -hmm. Like a chicken and egg scenario. <laughs> so I put all my passwords like in one place, but then how, uh -huh. do I, how do I identify myself to the vault to prove that I am who I say I am, right? Uh huh. And... And that's where there is no, the only good way to do that uh, right now, this is the, the most secure way to do it, is, is like this. The thing that creates you injects you with identity information, right? So what that means is that 
if you are a container in Kubernetes, Kubernetes will give you identity credentials. If you're a container in Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry will give you identity credentials. If you're a virtual machine uh, that's been launched on any of the public cloud providers, you get given unique credentials that identify that virtual machine. And that is a uh, kind of the way where you now don't have to go like, how do I identify myself to the, to the vault? I do that by presenting the credentials that were given to me when I was born as a as a, an entity in the data center, right? <laughs> this is getting real matrixy. This is we're getting yeah, 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 it is. It is. It is. <laughs> yeah. So the thing so, that creates you injects you. <laughs> yes, it's like like literally like a little like, syringe. So just I'm gonna inject you with, with, with the things that identify you. Uh, <laughs> So there's Deshaun's there's, here. Yeah. Hi, Deshaun. He's actually visiting from Chicago. Thanks for coming. I, okay, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, no worries. There's there's one other emerging way of solving this problem called Spiffy, which is the okay. secure production identity framework for everyone. I think Joe Joe Beta wrote the wrote a spec on that, um, and that one is much. It, it kind of goes like this. This is how it figures out who you are. Your, your uh -huh. app launches, right? And you're like, um, it, it goes something like this. Your app launches, it calls an API endpoint on the actual machine that it's on and says, who am I? That's what you say. You just basically say to it, tell me who I am. Okay. And, and there's an agent that runs on the machine and that agent is going to collect information about you. It's going to say, okay. oh, you are a process. Um, this mm -hmm. is the path you are on the hard drive. Uh, this is the, you know, the SHA, whatever of the of the process ID. Uh, you're running mm -hmm. inside of a Kubernetes cluster. This is the namespace you're in. So it collects as many facts about you. It ships uh -huh. those facts to a server. And then the server basically looks at all these attributes of mm -hmm. you. And then based on that, decides who you are. So it's a little okay. bit... We use a human analogy, we go something like this. Your first day working for VMware, you show up at the front desk and you're like, hey, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm the new employee. And then mm -hmm. the person at the front desk basically says, well, I have a photo. Uh, you kind of look like that. Like they use the, the photo to match you. So in yeah. the case of like Spiffy, it's, 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 it's the idea of we're going to collect attributes of the process the workload that's running and we're going uh -huh. to use that and say based on what we've observed about it we conclude that this is the user profile service running in the uh, kubernetes cluster Got um, it. and the advantage that spiffy has is that you can use it to you, you don't you, you you avoid the problem of you having to be injected with credentials okay because it, you call it and it comes back and says, here's who you are. Based on my observations, you are the user profile service. Uh, here's a certificate. <coughs> here's some documents that, that you can present to others. It also makes it easier to do cross-cloud things. So that's, 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 Spiffy is pretty advanced. Um, but anyway, it's, it's fun stuff. It's super cool. Yep. I, yeah. Cool. So. So the number four item that so we can add to the list if you want to go there. Yes, I do. It's the nastiest problem of all. It's called securing <laughs> a service to service call chain. It's a problem. Securing, I don't securing, securing the service to service call chain. Yeah. Yeah. You got okay. it. Yeah. And the way uh, to, to kind of describe it is, is, is something like this. We've all we've all like shopped on 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 Amazon, right? And uh, you you go to the product page for like, say for a book, and mm -hmm. if you just think about like what are all the microservices that might exist on such a page, right? You might mm -hmm. uh, you might have something like uh, a product page service that collects all the data, but there's like the book details service that tells you this is the book, this is when it was published. There might be a pricing service that determines the price to show you. And that pricing mm -hmm. service might need to interact with the marketing promotion service to see what promotions are on right now. 
um, mm -hmm. and then it might interact with your buying habits service. So maybe they know that mm -hmm. if you land on a page, there's a 90% chance that you're going to buy it. So we mm -hmm. don't need to offer you a discount. <laughs> Uh -huh. you, because you, it doesn't matter. You're gonna buy it anyway, right? Yeah. So it could be different than if they observe that from your buying habits that you're gonna look at this page like seven times over ten days before you hit the uh -huh. buy button, right? So maybe uh -huh. they try to like, hey, special offer right now. If you buy in the next two hours, you get twenty percent off. Yeah. Right? right? Like, um, and then like you know you get these things on those pages. Be like. Well, if you buy this in the next nine minutes, in the next two hours, you can get it tomorrow, right? So uh -huh. it, it clearly needs to know that it has inventory somewhere. It needs to know how much it's going to cost, that the shipping uh -huh. is available. So these things that we perform, like like buying something, it's not uh -huh. one call. It's like one thing calls another thing, calls another thing, calls. It's a web of calls. Uh -huh. And that raises the problem of, how do I secure that call chain? How do I make sure that uh, nothing is um, uh, leaking, uh, so to speak, from one service calling another? And, mm -hmm. and there, there's, there's two problems there that people typically conflate. They conflate workload identity with user identity. Okay? Um, okay. And... Um, Workload identity is, let, let me give you an example. Let's say you you have a money transfer service. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you happen to want to transfer money from your Canadian bank account to your US dollar bank account. So in order to do that transfer, you need to know what the exchange rate is. Mm -hmm. So the money transfer service needs to call the exchange rate service and get the current mm -hmm. exchange rate. Now, the exchange rate service doesn't really care that Adib is on the other side trying to transfer money between two accounts. It just basically mm -hmm. needs to know who's calling me. Are they allowed to read the exchange rate? Yeah. Right? Which is very uh -huh. different than, um, for example, your um, profile service where you want to update your mailing address with the bank. Well, definitely wants to know that Adib is the one that's updating his, 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 his physical address, right? Uh -huh. uh, and so we established kind of like the user identity at the end uh -huh. of the system. It's the first thing that we see, like when you log into the bank, when you go to check out on Amazon and ask you to re-authenticate. Uh, and, um, and that's where the OpenID Connect and the Web Authn play that role of uh, identifying who you of are. Of the user, the yeah. user identity, but not the workload identity. identity. You can use um, you can use OIDC for sure for machine okay. identity. Okay. You still have that secret zero problem of how do you where do you stole your creds to to talk to it? Um, yeah. And and the 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 workload identity should be something that is completely automated by the platform you're running on, right? Because mm -hmm. and and each workload needs to have like completely unique credentials that identify it, including mm -hmm. like when you scale it up. So if I run three instances of my user profile service, each instance of the user profile service should have separate credentials that identify which instance it is, as mm -hmm. opposed to a common you know, username, password type of thing. So platforms are how you solve the service-to-service -service problem in combination with mm -hmm. other stuff. There's no protocol today. It's more a bunch of patterns. Um, they're easier to implement on art. Like the, the components you need to, um, to solve it are a mix of API gateways, service mesh, um, you know, container orchestrator, cloud provider, vaults. Um, I can't, like I'm, I'm struggling to, we don't have enough space. We need like a whole thing. <laughs> so, so, uh, really quick, I want to say hi to David Michael. I don't think uh, I think you're new here. So, welcome. Thanks for coming. David said this is such a cool idea. It's fun to watch these sessions unfold. And Deshaun agrees with something that you said, but sorry, Deshaun, I don't know which thing it was. Um, so, what you're talking about now is this is a hard problem to solve. This service to service call chain problem. It's yeah. um, helpful to use a platform, right? Yeah. 
And then I would like to maybe capture that a little bit and, and just quickly have you list off some of the, th the characteristics of a platform that help with this problem. But let me, right. um, let me get the beginning of that written out. Yeah. Uh, we will have, okay, so. All right, so what are some th qualities of a platform that so help I'll, to I'll give solve you, this? I'll give you the, the primary quality of the platform is one where you're, uh, before you write down, let me just try to generate it in dialogue just to just to, to see okay. how, how to best phrase it. So you want a platform where you tell it what your intent is, not how uh -huh. to do something. And that platform needs to take the intent that you have and translate it into all the complex rules underneath. So oh, for example, I, I basically want to say something to my platform like, this is an API, it's public facing. It's customer mm -hmm. facing on the internet. Or mm -hmm. I say to it, this is a microservice and it's internal. And it then basically the platform is going to say, okay, because I know it's publicly facing, I'm going to do these 20 things. I'm going to configure A, B, C, D, E, F. I'm going to configure, you know, the, 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 the gateways this way. I'm going to configure the Kubernetes cluster this way. I'm going to, you know, put slap this level of armor on that level of protection, all this type of stuff. Because if you express your intent, your intent does not change. How you deliver that intent can be radically different. And you want something where uh, the platform over time gets better at delivering on that intent and gets more and more. Mm -hmm. clear. So let me let me give the VMware perspective on what theoretically is possible. So you say this is publicly facing, right? Great. And mm -hmm. uh, you then from that derive uh, generate a bunch of certificates, you uh, program a bunch of sidecars, you might even get down to creating a subnet in a in an underlying network, which is micro segmented with a distributed firewall, uh, and on and on and on. Like, if you don't uh -huh. intent at a high level, you can translate that into configuration at the layer below, which can then uh -huh. be translated into more configuration at the layer below, all the way down to you have something running in a smart network card in a uh, in a physical server somewhere that's actually protecting you. So which which so the human part of that is only like the intent and the high level configuration, and then the rest of that can be machine or software derived. Is that Correct. what you're saying? Yes. Cool. Yeah. You you want to start with your intent as the developer of what this uh -huh. thing is. And what are the, from that, you're like, what are the security guarantees I need for this? And then let's let's compile those down to, uh, to, to layers. Because like, like fundamentally with technology, it's always layered, right? You have mm -hmm. like a layer at the bottom, which is the hardware. On top of that, you have the operating system. On top of that, you might have containers uh, or virtualization. Maybe okay, let's do it. Let's do it the VMware friendly way. Hardware, mm -hmm. virtualization layer operating system, container, application, right? Um, uh -huh. Inside the container. And each one of those layers has security controls that need to be configured. And the way that we've always done things a lot of the time is we manually configure those things at the bottom. When we go to the layer above, we manually configure mm. the one there. We go to the mm -hmm. layer above. And we can, and I'm saying is that we're moving towards a world where you want the platform at the top to declare your intent as developer. Mm -hmm. You want it to translate your intent into the configuration that is optimized for security uh, of the topmost layer, which then says, mm -hmm. okay, to deliver that, I need to go to the layer below that and configure it a certain way, which then says, well, to do that, I need to go to the layer below that all the way down until you hit the hardware. So... If you look at what VMware sells, like that's what we do with Tanzu application platform, right? We we basically say it's an intent-driven platform where you as a developer say, here's my workload, here are some characteristics of my workload, and it runs you through this cartographer supply chain, which is next week's episode, right? 
<laughs> yeah. So we're set up. We're set up well for for cartographer. Come back next week, everybody. <laughs> so I have a question. This uh, this part of it so far sounds really ops heavy. How does how does this relate to a developer? So it is you are it's how it relates to a developer is that you as a developer need to be able to take advantage of the platform that's available to you, right? Okay. So if you have so, a modern platform, your life is easy. We're back around, we're, we're circling back to the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. Yeah, use all the it's product. making your life easy, yeah. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so it's, um, if you don't have a modern platform, this is really, really hard to do. Like you can okay. do it, but it's gonna be a one-off like duct tape and spit type of solution, uh, which uh -huh. is unique to your environment and it's not repeatable. You can't just say, um, uh, like like uh, you can't just automatically get authority to operate. Like that's, that's authority to operate is a term that's used a lot in the military and in the uh, high security government organizations. And like mm -hmm. one of the, there's a lot of really good blog posts uh, that we've done in the past about how uh, working with the U.S. Uh, military, we were able to get continuous authority to operate. Why? Because it's the things where you can declare your intent and uh -huh. um, and go from there. So we have a, a comment from Nick that says, "Bring in the second board." I'm feeling, I'm feeling that. I think I, I like this much space we can fill in maybe with some big takeaways but, right. we're, but it's well, been this has been really great yeah yeah so, so the the fifth item to add on that list and there's sorry, a fifth it's, item oh no yeah, I thought it, there it, were it's, four. A, it's a simple one you could probably do it like in tiny letters I'm gonna do it up here <laughs> well, well, let okay. me tell you what it is first it's it okay. really is like as a developer it's really you need to learn the security features of kubernetes Ah, uh, that's it's, a, it's, uh, what Salaboy is because, talking about. Because, like, like you know, the security, the securing the application credentials, the service to service okay. calls, those are two difficult problems. But if, what it boils uh -huh. down to is the starting point for both of those is like learn the security features of Kubernetes. Like Kubernetes is a big, giant, complex system. It's going to be around for a long time. It's like the new uh -huh. Linux, basically. And Linux is always complicated. It was always complicated, uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. but it's very powerful. So um, you got what you pay for. So go and uh, invest a little bit of effort on. Uh, oh no, my face! I, was, uh, I almost wrote over my face. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry to interrupt. So we, the learning the security of uh, security like, features of Kubernetes on Kubernetes. That's something you want to be able to do. And when you say that, do you mean vanilla Kubernetes or do you mean like related to Salah Boy's question earlier, like the different technologies that can that are related I, I to mean, I mean that the, can work with Kubernetes? Yeah, I mean the ecosystem. I mean like like okay. how do I containerize a workload? I mean, uh, how do I use like you know the policies that are available out of the box in Kubernetes? Like, how do you use Kubernetes secrets securely? How do you use config maps well? How do you um, uh, use network security policies? Whatever is available out of the box in the Kubernetes ecosystem, how does it all come together for you to go to production? It's kind of your platform, right? Uh -huh. and, and you can kind of start with, uh, you know, vanilla Kubernetes. You can go higher up and, you know, introduce something like tons of application platform on it, which really takes a lot of... Uh, knowledge it makes things secure without you having to become an expert at kubernetes so the fifth one is an optional one for those who want to be like more ninjas right then they want to mm -hmm. be like uh, uh, you know i always like to know how things work even if i don't want to toil writing the yaml right i want to know what it's doing yeah build packs photographer harbor um service mesh right like all all these the Kubernetes ecosystem is a strategic thing you should know about as a developer fairly well. It feels like you're giving all the developers a lot of homework to do. Yeah, I am. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a lot it, to know. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. But you know what? Here's one thing I want to point out to the developers about it. 
is that uh -huh. some of the items on this board uh, are timeless in the sense of like uh. Uh, you don't have to worry about that thing becoming obsolete. Like certainly I started off my life doing computer graphics and games and stuff like that. And I've learned so many Java frameworks that have disappeared into thin air. They're not relevant anymore. Who knows EJB, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and C++, uh, all these things where you learn something and it's only really good for a couple of years. Whereas this stuff is actually good for all of your career. Like TLS isn't going yeah. anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. uh, OpenID Connect, it's not, it's, it's not like, uh, it's not going anywhere. So it's WebAuthn. Mm -hmm. So these security concepts, while it's a lot, it's something you need all the time and it, mm -hmm. it isn't going to change. Like the crypto fundamentals, it's not going to change like massively, right? Mm -hmm. um, we have some comments from the chat. We have uh, Defined is here. Happy, happy Thursday. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, we have a question, uh, Baba USA. Who architects all these parts to make the project on board to production? Ah, good That's question. A good question. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so there, I'm going to break that up into the following part. So there's the part of it where ideally you have a platform team that is operating a platform that helps you solve, gives you the infrastructure you need to solve uh, securing application credentials and securing the service to service call chain. Uh, so you have a high quality platform that is a paved road. The second part of it is more on like app architects that give you like a Git repo with uh, a patterns for how to make this happen. So as a developer, I go there and I'm like, hey, I just want to do the corporate way of writing an, a public facing API or an internal API. And I get like a temp and I want to do it in Java and I want to use this or that, or I want to do it in Ruby or Python. And it kind of gives you a working uh, CI example of how to do this. This is the emerging world of developer productivity engineering. Uh, we do this in Tanzu with uh, Backstage and with Tanzu Application Accelerator. Um, so there's, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Let us know. And if there are any other questions, I feel like oh, we're about to start a recap now. So while we have the the ears and minds of a brilliant security expert, if you have any questions, now's your chance. Um, Nick has a very good point that you don't have to learn it all in one go. So even though this is a lot to learn, there's no rush to learn it all. Yeah. But it, it will help you in your career. Yeah, and 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 you know this is why this is why I'm I'm putting together that book and why it's obscenely large book. It's 24 chapters because it mm -hmm. it does yeah. cover all of the items here. So I want it to be like I don't want as a developer to have to buy like seven different books and and six seven of those books are going too deep on something. Uh -huh. I wanted the one stop that covers all of these things in one place. So when will your book be finished? Theoretically, in August. Practically, okay. <laughs> no. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm stepping up the stepping up the the the, the speed on there. <laughs> we have some great comments from David yeah. Michael. Really excited to see the backstage integration. Backstage is cool, and uh, <laughs> 24 chapters of making it easy. Yeah, exactly. Easy quote. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Maybe I put it up into two books. And Mabusa says we have a small space on the light board, so we, we can cover this much more material, <laughs> or we yeah. can give me a funny hat. Um, I would like, do you know what I would like to cover in a recap? Maybe if you could um, pick a couple concepts that you, if if people only remember two or three things from this whole time together, what, what would you want them to take home with them? Yeah, so um, it's that you as a developer, really have an opportunity to learn a lot about security. Start uh -huh. now, don't wait. And if you're looking for something to start, uh, set yourself three goals. Number one, learn TLS. Number two, okay. learn OpenID Connect. Number three, learn WebAuthn. It's as simple as that. I have, where does the, the OWASP top 10 seems like an important thing to it, learn? It, it is, um, mm -hmm. uh, and 
I look at that as, so there, there's a whole aspect of security around secure software development lifecycle that we didn't talk about uh, uh -huh. in depth. And it's, it's partly because it was just too much stuff to, to do. Uh, the OS top, top 10 for sure is a, is a great place to start on that. Uh, like, am I not, I don't want to be making the basic coding mistakes, but the deeper mm -hmm. kind of like building um, protocols that you use to assemble security, if you can get to the point where you understand how TLS works, you've by definition learned enough about the underlying crypto. If you learned OpenID Connect really well and you learned WebAuthn, you've learned a lot. You've seen that crypto in action, doing some really interesting things. And that prepares you to handle problem number three on the securing application credentials and securing service to service goals. But honestly, just start anywhere. Remember, your natural state is confusion. Mm -hmm. And you will be confused for a long time. And that's okay. Until it all starts making sense. One day, it's all going to just click in. This has been wonderful. Oh, thank you. We learned so much. We have we have evidence of all that we've learned. Um, they uh, asked for the book link again, so I put that back up. Um, Nick, the first one says, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's been really fun chat engagement. I've, it's been it's great to be back. I missed just two weeks, and I really missed you guys. So I'm glad glad to be doing this again. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I appreciate you, and I appreciate you too, Adib, very much, and your time oh, and your that was, that was super fun. It's a very interesting format that you have here. It's 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 pretty <laughs> awesome. I really like it. <laughs> Excellent. Me too. All right. Um, we have lots of loves. Oh, perfect follow up for Spring One Tour. My team's been in Chicago doing Spring One Tour, and I had to miss it because I was sick. But I'm so glad you came, Deshaun. David Michael says, so glad I caught one of these. Thank you. And uh, Nick says, they were dull weeks without the stream. That's too nice. And then Babusa, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, thanks. All right, y'all. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day.